Hey guys, Tyler here. Tatooine is one of the most well-known planets from the Star Wars franchise. It is the homeworld of the native Jawa and Tusken Raider species, as well as Anakin and Luke Skywalker. A sparsely inhabited desert planet in the galaxy's outer rim, Tatooine is circumbinary. It orbits two scorching suns, resulting in a dearth of abundant surface water. As a result, many residents instead draw moisture from the air, and the planet has little vegetation. By the time of the first Star Wars film, Tatooine is littered with large sand crawlers from abandoned silicate mining operations. Having fallen under the influence of the Hutt clan, it's become a haven for smugglers and criminal activity in the port cities of Mos Espa and Mos Eisley. At first a galactic backwater, Tatooine gains prominence for its role in the civil war between the Empire and the Rebel Alliance, but in today's video, I want to focus on the planet itself and examine the science behind binary star systems. Could Tatooine exist in our universe? Let's find out. Long ago, Tatooine was covered in rainforests and oceans, but for unknown reasons, it eventually became a hot desert world. Only a small portion of its northern hemisphere can sustain intelligent life, as the landscape is covered with dunes, mountains, and canyons, and the planet is frequently plagued by violent sandstorms. Traversing it is very difficult. Tatooine has three moons, Gomrasen, Guermesa, and Chinini, named after villages in the province of, well, Tatooine, Tunisia. The twin suns Tatooine orbits are called Tatu-1 and Tatu-2, a pair of G-type stars which appear to orbit very close to each other. In real life, for a long time, it was uncertain whether a planet orbiting a binary star would even be stable enough to be habitable, and indeed, astronomers have placed constraints on the theoretical orbits of circumbinary worlds, constraints that we'll get to in a minute. But first, let's discuss the different types of binary star systems, and then we'll establish what parameters would define the tattoo system if it were to exist in real life. Binary stars are generally classified into four types, based on the way that we observe them. These four types include visual binaries, spectroscopic binaries, photometric or eclipsing binaries, and astrometric binaries. Some binary star systems can actually fall into more than one category, such as both spectroscopic and eclipsing, but these categories all describe distinct phenomena. A visual binary is a binary star for which the angular separation between each component is great enough for them to be observed as a double star through a telescope or high-powered binoculars. A telescope's angular resolution and both stars' relative brightness are both important factors in detecting a visual binary. The brighter star of the two is generally designated as the primary star, and the dimmer one, the secondary. Spectroscopic binaries are detected using the Doppler effect. The spectral lines in the light each star emits shifts between blue and red as each moves towards and away from us around their common center of mass. Usually the separation between stars in spectroscopic binary systems is very small, and the orbital velocity very high. Most of these types of stars cannot be resolved as visual binaries, even with the highest resolution telescopes, and evidence of their existence comes from other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, such as infrared. Usually the true distance between visual binaries is very large, with each taking decades or centuries to orbit their common center of mass, hence why they cannot be observed spectroscopically. Eclipsing binaries consist of systems where the orbital plane of both stars is so close to our line of sight that the components undergo mutual eclipses. One such example is Algol, a triple star system in the constellation Perseus. Such binaries are detected, and their orbital periods assessed, by studying the system's light curve for dips in brightness. And finally, astrometric binaries consist of a single star that seems to wobble around an empty point in space, having no visible companion. 
Math can be used to infer the mass of the missing companion, which could either be a very dim star or an object that emits little to no EM radiation, like a neutron star. Once again, clearly, these classifications for binary stars are just as much based on how we can observe them as the actual characteristics of their orbits. But in fact, there is another classification system that has more to do with the distance between each star relative to their sizes. Detached binaries are binary stars in which each component is within what is called its Roche lobe, or a teardrop-shaped area where the star's gravitational pull is larger than the other components. While they are on the main sequence, such stars have no major effect on each other and essentially evolve separately. Most binary stars belong to this class. Semi-detached binaries are binary stars where one component fills the binary star's Roche lobe, and the other star does not. In other words, gas from the surface of the lobe-filling donor star is transferred to the other accreting star, often forming a disk around the latter. And finally, a contact binary contact. 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 is a type of binary star in which both components fill the Roche lobes. The uppermost part of their atmospheres form a common envelope that surrounds both stars. Such stars can merge with each other given enough time, as the friction of the envelope breaks the binary's orbital motion. W Ursi Majoris is an example of a contact binary. Binary systems that contain a compact object like a white dwarf, neutron star, or black hole can form what are called cataclysmic variable stars, as gas from the donor star accretes onto the compact object. This process releases gravitational potential energy, which heats up the gas even more and emits high amounts of radiation, including X-rays. Probably the best-known example of such a binary star is Cygnus X1, which consists of a blue supergiant star and what is widely accepted to be a massive black hole. We can apply some of these classifications to the components of the tattoo system. Given that Star Wars is, of course, in a galaxy far, far away, assigning any of the visual classifications to Tattoo 1 and 2 is largely pointless, though any observer in the Star Wars galaxy itself would probably detect them as spectroscopic or eclipsing binaries. As far as their distances from each other, they definitely fall into the detached binary category. But what about the presence of planets in such a system? While numerous binaries have been found to harbor exoplanets, such systems are rare compared to planets around single star systems. While data from the Kepler Space Telescope has shown most solitary sun-like stars host plenty of planets, only one-third of binary stars do. Some simulations show that even widely separated binaries often disrupt the protoplanetary disks from which rocky worlds emerge, but other simulations suggest binaries can actually improve the rate of planet formation in stable zones by stirring up these disks, increasing their rate of accretion. So what gives? Well, typical estimates often suggest 50% or more of all star systems are binary systems, and 50-60% of those systems are capable of supporting habitable planets within stable orbital zones. We can get a good estimate, it's believed, of where these stable orbit ranges lie if we know the separation of each star as well as their mass. The distance between components of a binary star can range between less than one astronomical unit, or AU, the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, and several hundred AU. In the latter instance, gravitational effects on a planet will be negligible, and potential habitability will not be disrupted unless the planet's orbit is highly eccentric. Some orbital ranges are physically impossible as they'd result in the planet being ejected from the system, while other orbits would still present serious challenges to potential biospheres due to extreme variations in surface temperatures throughout the orbit. Planets that orbit just one star in a binary pair, such as the planet Teller Prime from Star Trek, are said to have S-type orbits, whereas others that orbit around both, like Tatooine, are said to have P-type orbits, another term for circumbinary. 
For an S-type or non-circumbinary planet, if its distance from its primary exceeds about one-fifth the closest approach of the other star, its orbital stability is not guaranteed. Studies of Alpha Centauri have suggested that planets within approximately 3 AU of either star should remain stable. The conservative habitable zone of Alpha Centauri A is between roughly 1.37 and 1.76 AU, while Alpha Centauri B's is between 0.77 and 1.14 AU, both well within the stable orbital region. Planets with P-type orbits are only guaranteed to be stable if the planet's distance from the stars is at least two to four times the binary separation. If Earth-like planets form in or migrate to the circumbinary habitable zone, they theoretically should be capable of sustaining liquid water on their surfaces in spite of the interaction between the binary stars. As for Tatooine, while it is indeed a desert planet, it's not like the air is unbreathable or anything. It is true that most of Tatooine's inhabitants must keep their skin covered due to high temperatures and whipping sandstorms, as well as to limit exposure to harmful UV rays from the twin suns. Indeed, early during Tatooine's existence, it's possible that the twin suns may have encouraged the growth of oxygenating plants to create a lush, vibrant ecosystem. The combined stellar energy and ultraviolet radiation of these two suns would have thus represented both a gift and a curse on Tatooine, with the planet's own geological evolution forcing the ecosystem to change over millions, even billions, of years. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads, and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. May the Force be with you.